Nonetheless, there was less difference between the two kindreds, elves and men, in early youth, and a man who watched elf children at play might well have believed that they were the children of men, of some fair and happy people. For in their early days, elf children delighted still in the world about them, and the fire of their spirit had not consumed them, and the burden of memory was still light upon them. My Govan and my friends, Yoiston here, and I hope you all are doing well, wherever you are in Middle-earth. Today we shall speak as precisely as we may about two topics that are somewhat related but necessary in understanding time and elves in Tolkien's works. We shall talk about how time was measured before the coming of the sun and moon in Valian years, and how elves age. This will be a very complex and hopefully concise video, as with a topic like this, it becomes far too easy to get lost in the complexities of elves in Tolkien's works. If, however, there are topics briefly spoken of in this video that you would like me to expand on in future videos, please let me know. Much information for today's video comes from the Silmarillion and Morgoth's Ring, and the latter contains the notes of Tolkien about such things, but articles from Tolkien Gateway, the Tolkien Wiki, and other places linked in the description below immensely helps me understand these topics better, so please check those out for more information. I'll be honest and say that I was very confused while making this video, <laughs> so I hope to be as concise as possible as to not add further confusion about these topics. My friends, without further delay, let us begin our tale. First, let us look at how time was measured before the sun and moon. This information comes from the Annals of Amman in Morgoth's Ring, but many online lore masters have done a great job of breaking this down in those aforementioned articles. Valiant time was ultimately measured at a slower rate than how we measure time today, for things in those Elder Days grew differently than they did after the destruction of the Two Trees, the continued influence of Melkor, and the changing of the world. It is said that one Valiant hour is equal to seven hours as we measure them, one Valiant day is 84 hours as we would count them, and one Valiant year is equal to 9.582 years of the sun, our years. But why are these years different than our own? Well, it seems the two trees, and maybe even the two lamps, waxed and waned differently than how the sun and moon bring light every day. The Valar, when putting the sun and moon into the sky, wanted them to complete their revolutions ten times faster than the waning and waxing of the two trees, as to match the growth and decline of living things on Arda throughout the seasons. However, the sun and moon were a bit slower than intended, and that is where we get the 9.582 rather than 10. One valiant day consisted of 12 valiant hours, being a full flower of both trees, and 1,000 of these days was one valiant year, with 100 valiant years being one age of the Valar, as it was called. Please check out the Tolkien wiki link in the description for their calculations on all of that. With this in mind, it appears the Valar came to Arda in the beginning 5,000 Valian years before the first rising of the moon, meaning 47,910 of our years before the coming of the moon which rose before the sun. Furthermore, the days before the years of the trees and the awakening of the elves are counted 3,500 Valian years, or 33,537 of our years. Those were the years of the lamps. Finally, the years of the trees as an age were 1,500 valiant years long, but again, that was before the sun and moon. So the years of the trees, in years as we measure them, were approximately 14,373 years long. But the light of the trees showed only for 1,495 valiant years, or about 14,325 normal years. There do seem to be a few rounding errors in Morgoth's ring, contradicting the exact number of 9.582, but after doing as much math as I could and looking at online resources, it seems that there were indeed some rounding errors in Morgoth's ring. There may be other errors, either with the numbers in the works or with my own, but I think this is as close to true as I could find. Thus the numbers I and other Tolkien scholars have found are a little different than the ones found in the book as there does not seem to be one consistent multiplier in the book. I think I've had my fill of math for one day. <laughs> now, even though the two trees were destroyed, the years of the trees went on to the year 1500, thus fulfilling the 5,000 Valian year quota of time after the coming of the Valar to Arda and the first rising of the moon. 
In time as we measure it, this makes the years of the lamps the longest age in Middle-earth, followed by the years of the trees. So when I say the destruction of the two trees came in 1495 of the years of the trees, that would actually be about 14,325 of the years of the trees, if we counted those years as we count our own. Melkor, during the Years of the Trees, was imprisoned for three ages of the Valar, as they call it, which is approximately 2,875 years of our real time. Okay, I think we are done with the numbers now, thankfully. <laughs> I'm sure that was all pretty confusing, but feel free to go back and watch that part again if that helps, and definitely check out the uh, links in the description below, that should help as well. Now why is all of this important? We must remember that everything that happened in those years actually happened over a longer period of time than it seems. For whenever Tolkien gave us a date for something during the years of the lamps or the years of the trees, he used Valian years, not our years as we measure them, which would be the years he used in the First Age and beyond. Tolkien wrote that he felt the ages actually sped up over time. Also, in any conversation about the ages of elves that were born during the Years of the Trees, such as Galadriel and Círdan, we have to remember that they were far, far older than they actually seem in our years. Because again, they were born during an age where every year of theirs counted for many more years for us. For they were born during the time before the moon and the sun. Now, let's talk about how elves age. Ultimately, elves age in three cycles. Again, more of this information may be found in Morgoth's Ring, but this time in the Laws and Customs among the Eldar section. And the section also contains other things, like marriage customs among the Eldar, that shall not be much discussed now. The first cycle of elven life was youth and adolescence. An elf child would learn to speak, walk, and dance before they were one year old, for their wills came quickly to mastery over their bodies. In their early youth, elf children and mortal children were very alike, loving nature and the world around them, not being consumed by the fire of their spirits, nor the burdens of their memories. Now the children of men would start to outpace the elves in looks, reaching their full height faster than elves, and looking more as they would throughout their mortal lives, more quickly than the Eldar. In body, men grew faster, but in mind, elves grew swifter. Elven children were quite smart and autonomous. Now it would be at age 50 when elves would attain the stature and shape of their beings that they would keep for the rest of their lives, and for some it would be that they were 100 years old before they were full grown. However, many elves wedded in their youth, soon after their 50th year of age, and in such marriages they would produce more elves. Now most elves we see in Middle-earth were in their second cycle of life, after that 100 year youth. Now, we do not know exactly how long this second cycle lasts, as it is their adult phase. However, just as elves were, in their nature, impressionistic and very feeling in the world, the events of their lives, especially those of great tragedy and sorrow, could speed up their aging, allowing them to enter the third cycle of their lives, just as the toil of many, many long years might. This third cycle is reserved for the most ancient and burdened of elves, and this was when some might grow beards. The only exception to that is the elf Maton, the father-in-law of Feanor, who grew a beard early in the second cycle of his life. It is rare to see an elf of Middle-earth in the third cycle, as most of the eldest of the firstborn lived in Valinor, or had been slain during the history of the world. Now like I said before, events of sorrow or tragedy, if they did not kill the elf, typically aged the elf greatly. We see this with Gwyndor, who suffered as a slave of Morgoth and Engband for 14 years before he returned to his people in Nargothrond. He appeared greatly aged, and his own people struggled to recognize him. Now to bring Valian years into this, Círdan the Shipwright, who was born close to the time of the awakening of the elves in the Years of the Trees, was, in our years, extremely old, being over 10,932 in our standard of measurement. Besides just the number of years in his life, he had also seen many of his friends perish over the long ages, so time wore heavily upon him, so he was most certainly in his third cycle. We see this also as he had a beard during the late Third Age. Galadriel was also born in the Years of the Trees, not quite as early as Círdan, but that makes her also one of the oldest elves in Middle-earth during the late Third Age but I am unsure if she was in the late years of the second cycle of age, or in the early years of the third cycle. Now I must add that, in terms of years, of course, elves were immortal. 
and they felt the call of the sea, especially those elves who had stayed in Middle-earth over the long ages of the world. And they would either accept the call of the sea, as most did, and go to the lands that were as undying as they were, or stay in Middle-earth and let the toil of the years and events of them take hold, fading them away and making them shadows of themselves. Certainly, it must have been hard for elves, being themselves immortal, to see things mortal and always changing unlike themselves in Middle-earth, so Valinor and its unchange must have been a comfort to them. The bodies and spirits of elves were meant to endure together, but if they were parted and the body died, the spirits could go to the halls of Mandos to await reincarnation into a body identical to their former body, as it would be crafted by the Valar. Some elves, such as Fenrod, Luthien, and most likely Glorfindel, went through such a reincarnation, while the reincarnation of other elves, such as Feanor, was delayed due to their actions in life. But an elf could choose not to reincarnate, or they could choose to delay it. And then the elf may choose to return to Middle-earth or to stay in the Undying Lands. Either way, elves, in both spirits and in bodies, were forever bound to Arda until the end of the world. Thus, we come to the end of our tale about the Valian years and the aging of elves. From this tale, we see how vast the time of the world really is, and we see how we must find a way to accept time as it goes by, and we must also accept how age changes us, just as the elves, immortal as they were, had to grasp such concepts. Thank you all so much for watching, I really hope you all enjoyed this rather different and kind of confusing video. Let me know your thoughts, questions, additions, and corrections about this video in the comments below. If you enjoyed, please hit that like button and share this with a friend. I'm glad I took the time to make a video on these subjects, as it taught me to change my perspective on how time was measured before the moon and sun in Middle-earth, as well as how time even had an effect on elves. Please check out our music channel, Facebook, Twitter, Merch, and Patreon for our Discord server and podcasts. Links for all of those are in the description below. I also wanted to give a shout out and thanks to our Valar tier patrons over on Patreon. Adrian De La Torre, Chris Ortner, Peter Shepard, Kyle Wetzel, Lane Grimes, Mr. Vat Nadal, Samuel McBee, Jonathan Putnam, and Kyrie Kawaii. Finally, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell button to join the Men of the West and all of the Free Peoples today, and I'll see you all again next week with a video on Eowyn, the Shield Maiden of Rohan. Everyone, as always, thank you all so much for joining me on this adventure. Until the next one, my great friends.